All right, if everybody could grab a seat, please. So as we heard last night uh, during that inspiring group of speakers, um, Kroger, who is one of our major sponsors for this conference, is doing incredible work in the communities that their stores are located, um, as well as making fair trade products available to a much wider range of consumers than we've seen in the past. Um, and as we heard Lisa reference, they recently had a trip, uh, took a trip to the Philippines to visit coconut farmers, um, and we get to take a sneak peek at that. Um, so to set up this uh, this brief video, let me welcome up Carrie Puxtis from Kroger. Hi, everybody. Um, I am absolutely honored and humbled to be here with all of you today. Um, what a great opportunity this is. Um, so at Kroger, we always try to make decisions based on what's important to our customers. And increasingly, more and more all the time, our customers are asking us where their products are coming from, where we're sourcing ingredients that go into products that go into homes that people are feeding their children. So we are working really hard to have a very sustainable and transparent supply chain. So that was one of the motivating reasons why um, I convinced our VP of our corporate brands to travel around the world to do an origin trip to figure out coconuts. So first of all, from a marketing perspective, I think Coconuts were branded wrong because they're not a nut. You know, it was like, what is this coconut? Is it a nut? Is it a fruit? Is it seed? Um, so I wanted to get to the bottom of that. And we also wanted to elevate our partnership with Fair Trade. Um, we're so proud. And so <laughs> this video that you're about to see is just a, a small glimpse into our journey. Um, and there's going to be a lot more that, that comes a little bit later. So um, the Kroger Company for Earth Month is having an event called Sustainability Lives Here. And that kicks off April 15th. We have all of our fair trade products um, at a great price. There's digital coupons. And we're sharing content. And we're really elevating our message of zero hunger, zero waste. So there's upcycling tips and zero waste recipes. So I would encourage you all to come visit the website, sustainabilitylivesheer.com, and get some inspiration. And we're going to have other pieces of this trip that you won't see. Um, there's opportunities to see the school feeding program that the fair trade premiums go to, um, meet some of our farmers, and get to the bottom of the coconut. So um, we've handed out some Simple Truth organic popcorn for you to enjoy while you watch this um, short video. And I hope to talk to you after it's done. Thank you. think of the coconut tree as the tree of life. Being a tree of life means that it is able to sustain the lives of people who takes care of it. Almost every single piece of the coconut tree and the coconut are used in different things. It's truly a zero waste plant. In making the sourcing decision for our coconut products, it's the same as it is in, in all of our products. You, you look for where you can get the best product. But at Simple Truth, we truly travel to the ends of the earth to put simple within reach. The Philippines is composed of 7,100 tropical islands. And they're volcanic in nature, which has a lot of minerals in the soil and salt from the ocean, this combination brings in the best coconuts. When the coconuts fall from the tree, they just expertly de-husk them. And then the coconut itself that's left there, that's what goes to the packaging and processing facility. 
we first inspect the coconuts, make sure that they're fresh. And then from there, we open the coconuts. And then the water itself is taken out and processed within one or two hours. We are so proud to be sourcing only certified organic coconuts through our fair trade partnership. When consumers buy a fair trade product, it means that the producers, the farmers and workers that are actually making that product have complied with really high standards. Ang ibig sabihin ng fair trade sa amin ay pantay-pantay na kalakalan, mayaman at mahirap ay nakikinabang lahat. Kami po ay nagpapasalamat sa mga natatanggap namin uh, biyaya buhat sa fair trade. Saka po ay yung higit sa lahat, pantay-pantay po dito, walang lamangan, walang... Basta po magkakapatid po kami dito at saka po ay... As a shopper, you know when you go into a Kroger store and buy a fair trade certified Simple Truth product that you're supporting farming communities. It's very inspiring to know that a, a company like Kroger would commit to continuously support the smallholder farmers because that's what exactly they need. It's my hope that customers can really understand everything that the, their purchase decision does to impact people's lives. They can know that they're getting a clean, organic product that was produced in a very safe environment. But if they can even begin to understand the impact they're having on lives and communities, and this generation and the next, I think that would be a fantastic revelation. All right, everyone. I am going to be brief and transition us from that video because it really does key up a lot of what we're about to talk about in this next and, and final panel of the day. Um, and that is looking at how does fair trade impact communities? What, what does that look like on the ground? What does that look like for the people who are working on farms in cooperatives with local artisans? Uh, those are the voices that we get to hear Next, uh, in this session, I am very pleased, very honored to be introducing our next panel here from the source, Fair Trade Impacting Communities. We are honored to have an amazing group of speakers joining us from Arizona, from Colombia, from Peru. Uh, so thanks for those of you who have made the long trip to get here this weekend. And I will allow our moderator to give you all the full introductions of our speakers and, and set up the conversation further for you. But with, with that, I would like to introduce Tony Hall, our moderator for this session. Tony, I, I'm going to give Tony his due <laughs> and, and let you know who he is so he doesn't have to introduce himself. Um, Tony Hall is the chair of the board of directors for Fairtrade America. He's a consultant with expertise in business development, marketing channels, and global business with extensive experience in Asia and Europe. Tony has also spent many years promoting fair trade and supporting fair trade organizations, helping them improve their strategic and marketing skills, as well as finding new outlets for their products in Europe and in the United States. And with that, let's welcome Tony Hall. Thank you, Susie. I appreciate that. And uh, it's wonderful to be here. And hey, it's 4.30 on a Saturday. What are you guys doing here? <laughs> and I can't see you anyway because of these bright lights. But, but I'm the moderator, which means I'm hoping not to talk terribly much. Um, but uh, the purpose of today's session is about the impact on the producers. And I, I really want to focus on that. Some of the... Uh, uh, material today has been used earlier, um, so I want to make this short and have a real focus on the Q&A, which I think in the two sessions I went to got, got cut off a little. So, uh, just to tell you about me, um, I uh, got involved in fair trade by volunteering. Never volunteer, right? So, I, uh, 
I volunteered for a Dutch government-funded business consulting program in uh, WFTO Asia, and that's in, in 2003, so, and I'm still here. So. Um, just a little word about Fair Trade America. Uh, we're about five years old. We were set up by uh, Fair Trade Canada and Fair Trade International in Germany um, at the request of uh, licensees who, uh, who wanted to stick with the, uh, the global mark of uh, Fair Trade International and also with some, uh, some pressure from the all you can be um, community. So that's where we came from. Um, we are owned by, 50% uh, of our operation is owned by three producer uh, co-ops. Um, CLAC, you probably know, sorry, networks. Um, CLAC, you I'm sure will know um, in, in this part of the world. And about 30% of our licensed income goes to investing in um, the international system. So let's look at the next slide. Um, let's move on because the introductions uh, will be made by the panelists themselves. So here we have a uh, representation of, of change, the impact of change, and uh, what really uh, is the goal of, uh, of our mission. Um, the theory of change says that we intervene in markets. Um, uh, Luis Miguel and I are economists, so we know about supply and demand, and uh, we're trying to distort supply and demand um, uh, with this model. Um, we need to stabilize prices, and uh, that's a major, major part of what we do. We increase the economic viability of our production communities, and we reduce the poverty levels which will lead us inevitably in the very short term, and indeed it's going on now, is basically the living wage debate. So, um, next slide. This is one example uh, of a uh, deployment of uh, funds, um, premium funds, in this case an educational um, initiative in, uh, in a banana co-op in, uh, in Colombia. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, Luis Miguel, um, who will talk to us about uh, the co-op, coffee co-op in Colombia. <coughs> okay, thank you. Um, I work in the, in the coffee cooperative of Anserma in Colombia. It's located in Caldas. That is, um, it used to be one of the most important regions for coffee in the coffee triangle, but now we are in the eighth position uh, <coughs> in terms of uh, production. Uh, I've been there for 14 months. I, I used to know about fair trade because I used to work in a factory that processes uh, fair trade coffee, and I saw, okay, yeah, it's 20 cents more, but just do the math and okay, pay more for the producers, but I didn't know the impact that those 20 cents made for, for the cooperatives, for the growers. And now that I'm in the cooperative, uh, I see how much we can do with that social fund and how much we can improve lives of the coffee growers. And that's why we are working in in improve uh, our sales through for trade. We had, uh, on 2015, we, we doubled the, the social fund we had, and we were working only with two exporters. So I was trying to find other customers, but like internal exporters from Colombia that buys for trade, and we now have like five different uh, exporters that buys fair trade to us, and we uh, added some money to the to the new fund in 2016. But to be honest, I heard from my colleagues that fair trade, uh, fair trade, sorry, is uh, it's getting too competitive. There's every time more cooperatives that wants to sell fair trade, and since we see the impact, everybody wants to be in that bus. 
And in the other hand, that uh, customers, but talking not to final co uh, consumers, but like roasters or importers, they are not believing that that money has really an impact and they don't trust that it's well invested. So I, I was really worried about that. But uh, after this meeting, I think I can go home with hope because I see that there's uh, a lot of young people that is believing in this and that we are aiming that this is the status quo that like they said uh, a couple of hours ago. And so I see that there's a future to that and that people are aware that we should treat well our, our producers of otherwise there is not gonna be producers at all in a, in a, in a couple of years. So um, I'm really happy for this uh, invitation and I will tell and to, to renew our hope in this program and to continue uh, working with it. And also, uh, since we're in coffee and, and we try to, to put a face to that cup of coffee that you take every morning because it's important that you know the producers, you know exactly where it comes from, and we are also trying to work in that way, and I think that goes uh, in the hand with fair trade. Now, like an opposite uh, direction is the same direction to know the source, to respect the source, and to pay well to the source. Thanks. I have Too short. Get to the mic. Uh, thank you, Luis Miguel. So uh, you're going to be called Luis. Uh, gives you a better chance of being on this panel. So now I'm going to move to uh, to Luis Heller, who I know very well from the World Fair Trade Organization, where I've also worked. Um, until last year, I was the regional director for, for North America. Luis is on the board of WFTO, which is based out of Holland, and is also on the board of uh, WFTO Latin America. So without further ado, Luis Heller. Hello, everybody. Um, well, I, I am also working in an organization called Alpa, it's a Peruvian fair trade organization certified. And we've been in this business for 30 years. The founders are two ladies. Uh, and if this uh, session is about impact, uh, impact is very important. It's in the, in the center of our uh, way of working. Because if after 30 years we don't show results, is something wrong with the organization and that is not good really for us or for fair trade. Uh, impact for us is to make this business sustainable. And to be sustainable means that because we're selling home decoration, wood, jewelry, silver jewelry, uh, mirrors, things like they are not really necessary to have in your houses because of look at the situation in, in the world, no economic situation. So the impact is to present a product that is appealing to customers. I mean, it's a good design, it's, it's quality, high quality, uh, and that to achieve that in these 30 years we've been working uh, in improving, innovating the process of production in the workshops, whatever is ceramics or is uh, textiles, alpaca textiles. And the uh, process of innovation of this process of production doesn't mean that we industrialize this process or this kind of uh, making ceramics or textiles. Is that we kind of analyze what is being doing in the workshop and we see how can we improve the ways of working there the, to speed up things, not in detriment of the of the workers, but to also in to look at the safety condition that they work to. Uh, for this is the center of things, and if we if we can tell you that. There are some producers they already export, that will be an impact. If we're telling them that these producers are uh, making, uh, uh, buying land or buying new ma machines, this is an impact. So for this it's important to talk to the producers to get to this level. We need to uh, look at the trends in the economy and designing and things like that, analyze them with them and get a new product, get the challenge of doing things with them, and I think this challenge has been taken, no? I have, a, well, you have the, the group of producers that we work with us now, is about 80 now, 
used to be uh, 10 years, 20 years ago, 120, and but now they are 80. The next slide, please. And we do this, uh, I'm sorry. Sorry. We do this under these principles, the 10 principles of fair trade. We are members of the WFTO, as Tony said. And I would like to show you a video, a small video, in, to kind of express, condense the thinking of, of producers. This is in Paucara, Huancayo, it's 4,000 meters above the sea, and we do their uh, pet covers, alpaca, everything is an alpaca, chows, uh, pillow covers, and we do it for an American market that is very challenging, and we do it for restoration hardware store, we do it for citizenry, William Sonoma, and uh, we would love to do things also for Mata traders too. Uh, the thing is that look at the video and then you can ask questions if you like. Thank you. La vista, los pies, el cálculo, la mano, más o menos todos los sentidos de trabajo. Iniciamos en el en Paucará. Yo solo como tejedor, ¿no? Yo desde pequeño yo tenía esa noción porque mis padres eran, eran tejedores. 25 chales de un color hueso, 25 chales de color gris. Ese era el primer, primer pedido. Ya tuvimos un pedido grande. Mil chales, mil chalinas. Eso también hicimos ya con cuatro tejedores. Y así sucesivamente pasó, nos decidimos trasladar el taller de Paucará a Huancayo, porque allá no hay posibilidad de educación para los, para los hijos. Ese es el motivo y por tal razón compré mi terreno para hacer mi casa y ya vinieron todos. Todo nos ha costado bastante, pero ya estamos por poquito para culminar. Comenzamos con Alpa a trabajar en 2003. Han tratado de contratar a, a consultores y con ellos hemos desarrollado pues, nuevas técnicas intelares, mayormente lo que es en lavado, en acabado, en todo. Veo que ahora creo que estamos creciendo porque trabajamos conjuntamente con mi padre, mi hermano y, y con mucha gente también que necesita y trabaja con nosotros. ¿no? Siempre hemos ido unidos, un almuerzo, una pachamanca, tener, por ejemplo, cuarto para trabajadores, tener un comedor para los trabajadores, eso estamos viendo hoy. Sí, pues nosotros sentimos orgullosos, no sé, por, por lo que nuestras manos de obras no sé en dónde estará, ¿verdad? Uh, queremos sacar adelante nuestras familias, nuestros hijos que tenemos ya, uh, no queremos que esté como nosotros. Entonces, no solamente en nuestras familias, de repente en nuestros vecinos, ¿no? en los familiares que hay en el campo que siguen, entonces salir adelante y dar empleo a los demás. questions uh, for an extended Q&A um, after our next speaker, who is Marta Kiros, and uh, she is from uh, Wholesome, and uh, will be assisted by Natalia. Hello, everyone. Well, my name is Marta Kiros, and I work for Wholesome Harvest. I am the vice president of Fair Trade, which I'm very proud of. Too. <laughs> from the committee. I Sorry to interrupt. I also want to add that it's the only person I've seen here at the conference with the word worker in the description. Yes, I work, I work at uh, packing tomatoes, which it's awesome. I like what I do. Well, I want to talk about a little bit about our impact and fair trade, what we did for wholesome workers. At the beginning, it was very hard for them to listen to us, to believe in us and what we were doing, which they didn't believe us. They thought we were just using their money to do whatever. So by the time we did a boat where everybody had to vote for three things that they wanted to do, the needs for, for the wholesome workers, which was transportation, insurance, and homes. So we did the boats and the winner was insurance. So we did 
just by one boat, insurance won between houses and insurance, but that was the first boat that they did. Sorry, I'm kind of nervous. <laughs> but um, they wanted insurance, so we did. It took a little bit longer because it was harder than what we thought. But at, the more that we did, the more that we found out, that we figured out how we were going to do it, it was getting better and better. But when we would go and talk to uh, our workers, they wouldn't believe us. They were like, ah, you guys are just playing with us. They're just, you guys are just using the money. We we're like, no. So one day, an uh, insurance company went to Wholesome to, to talk to them about the budget, how it was going to work. And when they got there, it, we only had eight people with insurance. So it was kind of hard to get everybody involved because they don't want to get involved with insurance. So when the girls from insurance went and talked to them, and you should have seen, it was something very awesome because it was packed. Everybody was there. Everybody wanted to know how was it going to work, how, how is insurance work. It was going to be a lot of money. It was going to be a little bit of money. So everybody was there. So out of eight people that we had, 80, 90 people got insurance. So that was a big impact for myself to see, to walk to where the insurance company was and everybody was there. I was like, out of eight people, we went to 89, let's say, which it was a big impact. And I was very proud to see them there. And so, so far, we're working on our next project, which it will be home. It will be helping them to get homes, people that they're renting and stuff like that. So we're working on that too. Thanks, Mata. Um, I'm going to use my privilege to uh, ask one question of each of our panelists, and then I'm going to throw it open for an extended Q&A session, as I, I mentioned. So my first question is for Luis Miguel. Um, can you give us some examples of uh, impact projects that you've uh, triggered and developed in uh, Café Culturas? Okay, uh, one of the programs we have is uh, insu insurance, the, like for life insurance for the, the members. Uh, we used to have it for, for a couple of years now. It's uh, a million pesos. It's like $300, not too much, but it can make a difference for a, for a coffee grower, especially on that uh, hard time of uh, when they have to spend in the, in the funeral and since the fair trade fund growth, we, we tripled that uh, insurance uh, on 2017, last year. So we, we have been the triple for this, these two years in a row. Uh, also for production of coffee, it's very important to fertilize. So we have a, a program that we loan uh, money to the coffee growers for a year with no interest, uh, I mean, when they see it, it's no interest, but actually what, it, what it's paying the interest is the fair trade fund. So they can do all the three fertilizations in, in the year. And also we made some changes that doesn't mean to have uh, more money or more inv investment, it's just to know exactly what they need. For example, in this, uh, loans for fertilizer, they only could took it once. And sometimes the money that they have allowed uh, was good for the three fertilization process in the year. But we made them take them uh, at the beginning of the year so they have to storage and maybe get damaged, etc. So we change it to a rotating loan so they can take exactly what they need uh, each four months. Uh, we also have uh, health programs. We worked with a dental program last year. Uh, we work in five municipalities, five towns. Uh, so they made a campaign in, in one of each. So it uh, was like 120 people, uh, members and their families that went to the dental clinic for a, for a cleaning session. And also 60 growers. Uh, uh, older people that had to change their their teeth, uh, their teeth. Sorry, uh, they they got it for free with the with the program. 
uh, also one of the most important programs that we had last year. We made a survey two years ago, a survey to, to know our, what are the needs, what were the needs of our members. And we saw that um, in the process of coffee, uh, they need a, a space to dry the coffee or maybe a mechanical way to do so. And most of the coffee growers <coughs> doesn't have you know, space or, or the infrastructure to, to dry the coffee. And especially in the crop season that is from October to December, it's the rainy season, so it's got worse. So 20% uh, of our purchases are on wet coffee, and that coffee is not that really good in quality. Of course we can sell it, uh, sell coffee is really easy. Uh, in this job you have to learn how to say no because everybody is asking for coffee. So you have to know exactly what you got and depending on the quality there's a better uh, buyer for, for each one. Uh, so the buyers for the wet coffee are not a very good prices so we have to pay less for the coffee grower when they sell it uh, wet. And also we have to charge for the process because we have a plant to do, to do the drying. But we, we learned that uh, and we saw that uh, coffee growers had to sell the coffee at 10% uh, lower price because they sold it wet. But since I'm an economist, so I said I can pay more if I can, if I can pay it well if I can sell it well. So let's find a way so you can dry it and I can pay you the coffee 10% higher because I can sell it also 10% higher. So we invest uh, like 30% of the, of the coffee uh, found we, we have in buying those uh, drying machines. So we gave 340 drying machines so now we have 340 members that are uh, that can uh, dry their coffee and sell it better to us. So we work like in the social, environmental, but also in ways today be more productive, more quality coffee so they can get better prices. Thank you, Luis Miguel. Um, moving on to Luis, uh, uh, you said earlier today, I recall that North, North, and South, South, and South, North, and North, South are, uh, have, have evaporated. There, there is no such thing as, as sourcing from the South and, and selling in, in the North anymore. I'd like, I'd like your views on that, and I, I recognize that you and I were in Delhi last November when WFTO, in fact, passed a resolution that they would support marginalized producers in what we used to call the North. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry. In reality, uh, and I talk to a lot to Bill, because we're members also of the steering committee of Fair Trade Towns International, that uh, as a fair traders, the, the idea to think that we have uh, North and South is, is not only old, but it's also in the real situation in the world, that is not uh, workable now. There are uh, small producers in the north as they are in the south. Uh, if the fair trade started this to helping producers in the south, it was real good and it's, it's, con it's gonna continue. But also we need uh, to look at our own countries and see that uh, in the north that we have uh, other small producers that can need also the help and also there be alliance of, of the South because we can come to a, 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 a consensus that this is a, a world that need to make people work together. I mentioned in the morning also, look at the situation in the world, no? 60 million refugees, and they're where they're going. No? Of course, you know the reasons, no? and, uh, but the thing is how can we approach these refugees? How can we approach the people who are being affected by the economic, international economic crisis if we don't embrace them also as a fair traders. For this, is, is a very important alliance in the North and the South in a global movement. It's a social movement. And that is one of the things that we discussed before we presented in New Delhi, this uh, resolution that was accepted. Uh, because I think we need to, to work together to solve some issues, or at least 
to fight against poverty, against a, a, for equality, but it needs to be done in a global movement. Thank you. Moving on to Marta, um, I think you, your organization may be unique in, in the sense that, that you have the same sort of growing on both sides of a border. Is, mm. is, is fair trade any different, one side to the other? Yes. Um, fair trade made a big impact on Imuris, uh, Sonora, which um, they have, they made a tortilleria, which they didn't have. Uh, they made a, it's called like a computer lab, which is cool. Uh, they have a soccer field. And there we have the two committee from Imuris and from Amado. We got together because we had um, X, Excel. Uh, we went to go learn a little bit more about computers, which Mexico has, um, they, Fairtrade has made a lot of difference in Mexico because they, they're more in need. They have transportations for their kids to go to school, and they have a tortilleria, they have a soccer field, they have a computer lab, and which it was, it's, it's a big impact on them. Because in Arizona, we have uh, transportation because of the, because they have transportation because of the state. So they help them. We don't really need transportation. So insurance made a lot of difference on our, on this side well, for us. Do you want to go through the, uh, the graphics, the images? Yeah, and, uh, hello. Can you guys hear me? No. 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 Sorry, hello. Just want to say, yes, my name is Natalie. I work with Fair Trade USA, and um, I supported uh, bringing Fair Trade into the United States and supported uh, the development of the program with Wholesome Harvest, and that's why I'm here to kind of just support. Um, just a, a, a quick comment that as the vice president of the Fair Trade Committee in Arizona, they, um, Marta and her colleagues have been able to, like she was saying, go into Mexico and learn from the already established Mexican fair trade programs with Wholesome Harvest and learn, um, learn about how they did the program down there and then, you know, took those learnings and brought them into the United States as well as additional learnings like Excel and such. And so, I don't know if you wanted to speak to this photo here since it has to do with the program you had just mentioned. Okay, well, that was uh, for the voting for the the three needs that um, they needed, they, and that was a day that, it was a big thing, because I was so nervous. I was more nervous there than what I am right now. <laughs> Trust me, I am. Because I know everybody, so I was afraid that I was gonna, well, okay. So it was hard for me to do that, because I was like so nervous, but I did it, and I did a great job. <laughs> So yeah, that's when we did the boating and everybody boat, everybody worked with us and it was, it was a really good day. Okay, we're a little ahead of schedule, so I'm gonna ask one more question of my panelists. Uh, we, I remember uh, Fairtrade LA and Joan Harper uh, having a dinner and almost all of us had had some sort of uh, experience in, uh, in, in development and that had turned us towards fair trade. But let me ask the question of our um, producers. What, what, when did you learn about fair trade and, and when did you start uh, participating in fair trade? So, Luis Miguel? Okay, well, as I said before, uh, I work in a coffee freeze dry factory, so we process uh, fair trade coffee, but it was just like in the middle of it, so it only goes like, okay, which is the source, I have to tell the customer what was the source and I have to, to say how much money I have to take to the other side, but, but I wasn't really involved in the impact, in the philosophy. Uh, <clears throat> but now in the co-op, uh, I do, and I see how important the program is. And also I want to say that for growers, the, the revenues are, are smaller, the margins, and also the cooperative, the margin is really slow, is really, sorry, is really low. And even though we have worked in, in trying to sell better the coffee, 
to transfer more price so we get more coffee of the coffee growers and to be more efficient in logistics in, in how we finance the coffee. Um, we increase our revenue in 60% and now we are getting like double the money. And even though we, do, we did all of this, the fair trade found is always higher. So the, the cooperative doesn't, it's a non-profit organization, but it doesn't mean we didn't need the money in order to grow and to, and to continue for other 50 years to, to be in the, in the region. But we need the money to invest in our members. But it's not enough. With the Fair Trade Fund, it's always more money so we can double or triple our capacity of uh, take an impact of, on, the, on the needs of our coffee growers. And yeah, it, the, the good thing about Fair Trade is like, like Mara was saying, that the needs in Mexico are different of the needs in, in Arizona. So the same is in our region. And the good thing about Fair Trade is that they let us decide how to invest the money because we know what are, are, what are our needs. So that's what I most like about for trade. Oh, thank you, gracias. Well, I think uh, for trade is universal. I mean, it's uh, uh, when I started working with Alpa uh, 14 years ago, uh, they were already in social responsible issues from the beginning. The first clients in 86 were uh, Gepa, El Puente, Euro, all the European uh, members of uh, WFTO, fair trade in general, no? And uh, the good thing is that, well, really I started to become a social worker and then I, I lived in Chicago for a few years, but I always was uh, interested in, in doing administration things. And I think in the morning they were talking about how can you as a professional can find a, a way to, to, to do social work too or social responsible kind of work. I think it's as an administration in res uh, human resources, you can do it. And uh, I found that the ALPA was uh, that kind of a place to work, no? And the most, uh, uh, what I hear also in this conference is that we are popular now, no? Fair trade is popular. And everybody want to be in that uh, uh, wave. But uh, the most uh, clear thing to me is that we need to prove as a fair trade that behind the product we are doing the principles of fair trade. For this certification is very important too, no? And build that need into the producers so they can empower themselves and do things as they were their regular lives, no? To have water, to have uh, safety issues, all that is important. And that is the connection with customers in the United States or Europe too, no? And also is the students, university students, high school students also have a very important role because it's the connection with the new things that look at fair trade and look at producers. I think it's a good brotherhood and sisterhood too, of course. Thank you. <laughs> Well, what I gotta say is farm work is farm work here in Mexico is the same thing because you do the same thing. So what I got to say is I like working, I like working for fair trade, well, doing what fair trade shows us. I learned a lot. Um, I've been with fair trade for six months, so I don't have that much experience. But little by little, the way I learn things, it's uh, I like helping others. We make difference, the big impact. I like to do that. Well, one of the times there were uh, buyers that went to go visit us at Wholesome, and I got to meet them, and I was there. And um, I asked them what they did with the tomatoes after they were done with them, and he told us that he threw them away. So I told them, why would you throw them away? That's like. That's our work, that's what we do. We work hard to give it to you guys to make sure it's good. So he didn't wanna be in fair trade at all, but somehow I got it to his head and he got fair trade. 
So it, there you go. We have another customer. Thank you, Marta. Okay, we're going to move to about uh, 25, 30 minutes of q and A. I I don't see a mic anywhere. But... <laughs> And if you could uh, tell us your name and organization, uh, that would be very helpful. Hello. My name is Travis, and I'm actually a fellow with Fair Trade Campaigns. Uh, my question is about education and how the premium goes into your community. Have you seen the next generation of students come back to your community and take what they've learned in school and university to actually empower everyone else, el everyone else around them? <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, the experience that we have in uh, in our organization is uh, that I uh, we receive a lot of uh, emails from uh, students that like to do volunteer work in our in fair trade, and also people who come to visit us and want to know not only about the headquarters office but to go to the producers and sometimes they travel a lot. The, in Peru, we're having a, um, a pool of people who are working in the university, San Marcos University, and also with the Association of Peruvian Exporters to have uh, not only presentations once in a while, but to have a, a class of fair trade. Is, is that important now that uh, even universities in, in Latin America, the issue about uh, Fair trade is, is not, in producer is very important, but not as much is in, uh, uh, in the university or school. So our task is to have these uh, kind of uh, interfaces, no? And uh, for this we are working now in, in Latin America too, to have fair trade, not only fair trade towns, but also for the town, for the universities. This is a, it's organized by the alliance between WFTO Latin America, CLAC, and SPP. We got together and to, decided to put aside difference and said what we can do about politics, in changing uh, policies in the government, and also to go to the universities and the for towns and push for the government to buy our products and also for us to buy our own products, no? But uh, this is, I don't know if that answers your question. Thank you. Marta? Okay, in Mexico, there was a farm worker that was working for Wholesome, was well, still working for Wholesome. His uh, kid wanted to go to the university, so they gave him a scholarship to go to school. So that, that's how they helped them. If I can tack on to that story. The, this gentleman that went off to university, he then came back, he studied computers and all sorts of computer science, and he came back and is running now that computer center in that photo that we saw, teaching Marta and other folks Excel and other people in the community. That's just one example of the scholarship program impact that they had. Okay. Um not going to exactly answer that question, but something related. <laughs> it's because in, in coffee, we have a problem of um, generation renewal because all the growers keep continue telling their sons that there's no future in coffee. You have to study and go away because uh, see how we are. So they are sending that message to them, so they always want to go away and maybe go to the city and have a, a not well-paid job either and uh, got stuck in traffic and they don't see how lucky they are to be in the, in the country to breathe a, a very good uh, clean air. So what we're trying to, to do is to show that everybody in their small farms, they can uh, manage it manage it like an uh, enterprise, like the, if you learn how to sell a better coffee or just sell regular coffee but try to understand the market and try to sell it when the price is good, not just waiting. Uh, I don't know how much it's going to be on the crop, but, but I don't care. No, if it's good price, you can fix it so there is a future to it. 
And also it's hard for, uh, we always said on fair trade that we don't support uh, child labor, but we can't confuse that to involve our sons and our child to love the, the, the ground working. I mean, of course, you're not going to put the, ch the kids to, to grab a heavy stuff uh, on this, but, but yes, to collaborate with their fathers to love the land, because if not, they, are, they have nothing to attach to the, to the, to the coffee grower. So we won't have anybody uh, interested in, in keeping growing coffee or different uh, vegetable foods in, in 20 years. Uh, and what we do with, uh, with uh, like a study or in that, those projects, we have a program with the FNC. They have something that is called Universidad del Campo, so like country university, and they teach uh, near the, the, the municipalities that are there, and they, sh they teach them well uh, ways to produce the the coffee or other products how to uh, have uh, accounting so they know how much does it cost to be productive to learn other things also uh, logistics uh, of accounting uh, things like that but but we have the challenge to show them that if you do it in, in the right way they can still live there have a future and have a life Thank you. Uh, let's take the next question and please feel free to direct it to one of the panelists. I see a hand there. Is that one working? That mic? Yeah. No, not the other. Hi, my name is Bianca from the University of San Diego. And this question is for Martha. <laughs> and I wanted to ask you, um, Halsam has done an amazing, like, modern, um, social change to put you as a worker in a leadership position. So I, w I wanted to ask you, what would you advise us that are creating an organization or running a business? Um, what would you suggest to us in, in regards to putting like someone, that, uh, maybe the community that we're serving in leadership positions like you are? Well, oh well. What I could tell you is, it's not easy. It's not easy to do what you do, especially if you want someone to believe in you and trust you. It's not easy, but don't give up. Just keep doing it till you get to their head and they'll, they'll believe you. I don't know if that will answer your question. <laughs> Next. I'm blinded by these lights. Yeah. Any hands? Yeah, there's a hand over there, but. Okay, over there. Hi, um, thank you for sharing your experiences. Um, so my name is Tangut and I go to the Middlebury Institute in California. And as part of my school trip, I had the opportunity to visit the Fairtrade uh, USA headquarters in Oakland, San Francisco, I believe. Um, and while I was there, what I learned was that there is Fair Trade USA and Fair Trade America, and that raised the question: Who oh, are they doing the same thing, and why are there two entities? And that triggered a question in my head: That there are so many other there is Fair Trade, and there are so many other programs that are uh, working towards the same goal, but kind of working in silos. Um, you, uh, the three panelists, as you are working in the field. Has there ever been a question of like, uh, you know, either from the consumer side or from the farmer side, uh, why should we trust with uh, fair trade? Why should we follow fair trade? Why can't we work with any other program? And if so, what would be your advice in terms of, you know, trusting the fair trade movement and following the fair trade movement compared to the alternative? And that's for uh, anyone. Thank you. Well, what a great question. Um, I'm going to ask the panelists to reply to the second part, which was essentially, um, you know, how do you justify fair trade when there's fragmentation? And uh, as chair of the board of Fair Trade America, I will then add a few comments. Mm, well, actually, for the coffee grower, they, they don't even know that they split. They just uh, receive the 
the we received the audit, the auditor of of fair trade, and and that it's good for the other for fair trade USA. So they don't have to do both because they they are like yeah one receives the certification of the another. So actually, it's transparent for the for the coffee grower. Well, diversity is good. Um, the thing is, um, let me give you examples of how we're working together, the main organizations. In the fair trade towns, uh, the main organizations of fair trade, fair trade international, WFTO, CLAC, SPP are working together uh, and to build, uh, give a more structural organization to fair trade towns. In, um, in Peru, we're working with a coalition of CLAC and SPP and us and WFTO to, to, have to get together into how can we impress upon the need for policies that help producers, whatever is food or artisans. And um, I will go by that. Uh, I'm not a new in this. Uh, World, but I cannot knew in, in 14 years in fair trade, but I see that there is a tendency now to 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 say this is what uh, make us uh, have the same ideas and work. Let's do it. If we even have a uh, we discuss it the, the main organization, the Charter of Principles, the uh, that is going to be presented this year to to the fair trade world and also to the world in where we kind of updated the principles, not to change them, but to say this is a, since 2009, things are going on different in the world. So we're gonna say, it, it's also it's a new generation, a very, a, a big generation, they are interested in fair trade. So we kind of also need to adjust. And uh, that adjustment make us a little bit different, but at the same day, the goals are the same, 10 principles and we're gonna go for it. Okay, um, <laughs> as, as the, the uh, let me answer the, uh, the first part of the question. We have to do an awful lot better. Um, you know, as, as Louise points out, that, you know, WFTO and, and Fair Trade International agreed a, a statement of fair trade principles and we would hope that other fair trade certification companies can sign on to that. I'd also point out in case you know you weren't aware of this but, but there's, there's, there's a bit of a merger um, mania going on in, in fair trade. Uh, Rainforest has merged with Oots, EchoCert merged uh, with Fair for Life, IMO. Um, and clearly we, we have to establish a common platform and uh, you know, we, we were established five years ago, um, and uh, now's the time, I think, to uh, start talking and agreeing the areas of uh, common concern and overlap and where we can initiate joint projects. Um, but watch this space. I just want to add one more interesting little comment, that at least from the produce and floral category, even with all the different certifications together, we are less than 1% of the industry. We are the 1%. And we need to work together to keep growing that because there's a lot left to grow, right? Thank you. I absolutely agree with that. I, I, there is another uh, development. Some of you may know the European Union has just given a three-year six million euro grant to increase the awareness of fair trade in the 27 European countries. And we need that sort of collaboration and uh, funding effort uh, in, in, the, in North America as well. And I, I see a hand right at the back there. Thank you. Hi, hello. Uh, my name is Pushpanath. And as you see in my card, it says freelance. And some people think, think it's a country. I, I hope it will be true, and we will all belong to the freelance country very soon. And I won't be contesting for the presidential post, so don't worry. Um, my, my quick question is to link to that 1%, you know, when does fair trade become main trade? 
And in your countries, is there any country movement towards building up a fair trade movement there? Not just as producers. It's just starting to happen in India. With some of us, we're starting to work on an India-based fair trade movement supported by both international as well as WFTO. If it is happening, what is uh, Fair Trade International or WFTO is doing regarding that? Building a fair trade movement in your country and what is the support being given by the two big organizations? Thank you so much. Let me try to answer that. Uh, principle six is about empowerment and a woman also is about equity, equality too. And uh, part of the the fight, not only uh, I have an opinion about that. Uh, we, this world is going to be changed by all human beings, not Trump, of course. But uh, <laughs> but the thing is that we need to work in. A, for this, we have ten principles, and we empower we empower producers. They are a woman. We empower uh, all kind of organizations that want to be part of fair trade to make the voice, the voice heard and also their actions. Fair, uh, WFTO uh, constantly present the ladies, like this one present now here, Anjali, here, and uh, this is a struggle, a continuous struggle, no? But we support anything that means that women are paid at the, for the same job, the same things, we do it in the in the producers, and I give you an example, no? In a, an op it was a problem, and there was an opportunity to, to do something about it. There was a, a client who wanted to give us, make us a big order for a year of rocks. Uh, rocks with, uh, alpa no alpaca, llama, and they were very, very difficult and hard to make it. The traditional wooden looms, and uh, it was difficult. And it couldn't done by uh, there was done by men in the in the workshop, and then the client, an American client, stopped ordering. And we said, "What are we going to do with this? Uh, uh, there is no orders. We almost closed the shop, and we were struggling to get orders, other kind of orders or, or more uh, uh, rocks, no? But it didn't happen. But it was uh, somebody. It was selling uh, William Sonoma order pillow covers, and that was a challenge because. The guys in the workshop didn't understand the meaning that we have to reduce the size of the looms, the, the pedal looms, and there was an opportunity to open to, to women in the workshop. And uh, there was a big discussion with them about uh, the principles of fair trade, and the women started making pillow cases for WSL, and the same salary. So there are concrete actions Besides the, the talking and talking about how can we present in the woman's equality, if not we do actions. We train them, we train them in the same conditions that we do it for men. And they work in, the, in a traditional environment because we're talking about 4,000 meters above the sea with men supposed to be like the ones who run the show. And it's not like that, it's actions where you allow women to be trained and into the same thing so they can get paid. And that was accepted by men and women, no? It's a, it's a work. These are actions. Thank you. Okay, we got uh, a few minutes left. Any other questions? Can you see one? Hi, yes. my name is yes. uh, Stacy Stoffer. I'm um, treasurer for Students to Abolish Sex Slavery at the University of Nevada, Reno. So my question to you is, um, how have your actions, your impact, um, affected those who have um, been victim of human trafficking and sex trafficking? Yeah, well, fortunately, we don't see that we have that problem in our region, so have no comments. No, but, mm, okay. No, it, mm, we have it in Peru, in, and is in an area is jungle where they uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, babies 
uh, women trafficking, boys trafficking, and this is supposed to, and destroying the forest too. And uh, we are, uh, we've been working for a few years in to have the fair trade gold and fair trade silver because uh, we needed to have uh, an impact in those areas. ALPA doesn't do that, to be honest, but it's that other organizations that work in Peru, they are fair trade organizations at the impact of flow. Uh, for the international, they're doing these things, no? Uh, because we need to respond to, to this thing. It's not, uh, it's, it's awful the way it happens. Denouncing, and, but be part of that, no? It's dangerous also to work in that part of Peru too, no? But there are courageous people who do that work, no? Monte, Monte. I, I, would, I would add, a, uh, um, it, it's come as a huge shock. Uh, to, to many people in the last three, four, five years, uh, uh, as Joan Harper, in fact, uh, mentioned in, in her panel, that this exists at all. I mean, I, I, I live uh, 10 miles from Disneyland, and it's been discovered it's a massive, massive problem. Organizations like the Salvation Army now have a major task force to try and tackle um, that sort of exploitation. Um, and, and we know it goes on everywhere, um, and we have to start addressing those, um, those problems and do a much better job. Yeah. And there was a question over there, I think, that I missed. Hi, I'm uh, Will Cottrell. I'm a science teacher from Richmond, Virginia. Um, and my question, I kind of want to direct at um, Louise Heller. I was fortunate enough a couple years ago to start doing research in several different parts of the world. Um, and in 2016, I was able to go to a conference um, for uh, glaciology and climatology um, at the university um, in Cusco, UNSAC. You might know it. Um, and while I was there and during a lot of my traveling, I noticed that there are a lot of similar items for sale in a lot of different countries. And particularly in Peru, um, there, were, there was some like uniqueness to the items that I was seeing. And a lot of the wool, the, the alpaca stuff, the um, I think it's guanaco wool, is that, am I remembering mm -hmm. the right animal, maybe? Um, I don't know, but yeah, glaciologist, not a zoologist. <laughs> um, but um, is there anything being done in, I guess, any of y'all's countries um, to get these fair trade products not just sold maybe locally or exported and sold in Europe or in the United States or Canada or Australia, um, but to get sold maybe in a city like Cusco, which is like a gateway for literally anybody going to Machu Picchu, and there are thousands and thousands and thousands of tourists that I saw just in my like few weeks that I was staying in Cusco between like trips up to the mountains. Um, so yeah, is there anything being done to get your products sold locally? Okay, uh, we, have a, uh, we have three stores uh, in 2000 and Twelve, we opened a store in Lima, uh, Casa Alpa, and uh, we opened two more stores in Lima. We tried to open in Cusco a store with our products, uh, and it was uh, m m the effect was not good. It was we lost a lot of money in that. And one of the things that we analyzed and we see what's going on here, people don't like it. In the case of Peru, uh, uh, the government start selling products from Peru instead of investing in making uh, our, our handcrafted products in Peru. Well, no, Chile, Ecuador, Bolivia started in their own countries. Uh, and then they created a market, a, a national market, Colombia, my God, Mexico. They, they, they promoted first their products and then they start exporting. I have, a, in Chile, we have a, a good experiences in the fair trade organizations, the Fundación Artesanía de Chile, who have done, who have done that and got a, a big uh, effect. Uh, before going to New Delhi to our conference, we kind of uh, talked to our organizations in Latin America, and we find out that there was a lot of sales going on inside the country. In their own countries, they're selling better than exporting. And one of the things that we discuss in, in our own platform in Peru is to try to push that, but the price, look at this, uh, the price, if you go to, to Lima or to Cusco, the products that you will find out there are, uh, they are not lead free. They are 
Also in the textiles, in the silver jewelry, you don't know if it's the quality of, uh, of jewelry, silver jewelry that you expected because it's 950, 950 or 925. So to, to, because it's expensive, the other thing is Peruvian or handcrafted products are expensive. And to, we tried, we didn't work, we discussing about doing it again, but, uh, but it's not easy, it's not easy to, to do that, to be honest. I, I would add that the country next door, Ecuador, in Quito, there's an organization called Sinchi Sacha, and they have five local shops that are integrated with ethnic restaurants, and uh, it's basically serving the, uh, the tourist market. And then I worked on a project where they obtained a million euro from the Belgian technical um, collaboration, the Belgian Development Agency, and they built a museum, and, and they specialize in preserving the artifacts and cultural heritage of the Amazonian Indians. So, so it is going on, and I know from WFTO in, in, in India that there's now significant net, networks of, of fair trade shops. Yeah. And also, okay. Can, can I? Yes, of course. Uh, it was, uh, I'm sorry. But I wanted to, I forgot something very important. And uh, WFTO is sitting down in, um, with the direction of handcrafted. It's part of the government uh, ministry and with association of exporters to discuss policies to present it to the government how to protect uh, the cultural heritage, but also how to uh, improve taxes. Uh, I mean, not get too much taxes for artisans not get too much taxes for exporters. So because this it's, it's whole chain is the one who need to be fixed, need to be uh, kind of uh, improved. So we're discussing these issues to present it to the government because it's, it's difficult to work in a, in a place where things are not uh, helping us. No? We don't see it only as exporter, we see it as the whole thing. Okay, unless there's one quick final question. Right at the back. We've got about five minutes, so apologies if I have to cut you off. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Maddie, and I'm the current business marketing development intern at uh, Fairtrade in Oakland. And uh, this year I was working on a Fair Trade 101 and looking at uh, how in fluctuations in demand kind of affect uh, overall need and uh, kind of like worker environment and the pressure it puts on workers. And I'm wondering how the Fair Trade minimum has impacted the overall um, production and sourcing and like uh, quality of the exports that you guys are putting out. Oh, and how can that serve as like a model for CSR for um, other businesses? What was the question? Huh? <laughs> I'm afraid the panel does not understand the question. Could you rephrase it and, and hold the mic a little closer? The microphone closer. We, we can't hear it. Yeah, so basically, um, how has having like a minimum for your workers, like the, a minimum uh, payment for your workers, uh, affected their motivation to work and the quality of products coming out and um, just in general, how can that serve okay. as kind of like an advocate for investing in good okay, CSR, co yeah. corporate social responsibility? So I think the question is, uh, how have minimums impacted uh, mm. workforce uh, in terms of wanting to work, and has it impacted on quality? Minimum price. Is it, but I'm sorry, is the minimum price or the minimum salary? Minimum salary. Oh, okay, good. Uh, no, because I, we are, I'm in a working group about living wages, because living wages is a, it's a very important part of our, uh, our fair trade. This is a very important part of fair trade. And uh, one of the things is you can build a living wage, you know about the, uh, how you're supposed to be living in with minimum uh, vitamins and things. So we have like in Peru, it's like a 1,200 soles. Uh, 325 per dollar, and the minimum wage now is 930 soles. That doesn't even work mm, for, for a living, really. In our case, uh, the idea is to, in, in conversation with, with the buyers, fair trade or no fair trade, 
is how can we build a salary that in least compete with the minimum legal salary in the country and bring, bring them up at least closer to the living wage. And we have the challenge of the, the clients, buyers from fair trade or conventional market, they don't want to have, they cannot pay these prices, high prices and products because of the economy. But also what we do is to work with them. First, we, don't, we cannot pay them the minimum legal salary. If not, they will not be with us. They will go someplace else. They will go to mining, construction, agro-export, but not with us. That is a big challenge for, in our case for handcrafted. So we need to, to improve ways of making a good product, improve the production processes to make it uh, more, uh, not only safe, but at the same time uh, cost efficient. And this is the investment with them. And for this, we, kind of, we pay a better uh, salary for them. Even though they, do, they work by piece, they don't work by day because traditionally they work by piece, but they don't work 12 hours a day, of course. Okay. You know? Malta? I noticed that when they pack for trade, the quality is a lot better. That's how I know. So they make <laughs> more money. Do you, do you guys choose higher quality products on the line when you're packing fair trade? Yes, they do. Well, the quality is the key. Yeah. <laughs> Luis Miguel. Well, uh, we have 2,000 members, and one, it, the average size is 1.5 hectare, so it's small growers, so they're more like they have an income, not a, a salary. And what we look is that when they do the accounting and they, they have like the cost of the production, they involve, they include their, their work. And what we look is that they can sell uh, above that uh, price. So in order to they having a higher income equals to uh, to the the national minimum salary. So, but but it's not a salary, but an, an income. And what we try to do is so they can sell better and also to uh, compensate so some of their needs with the the fair trade premium. Okay. Thank you to my uh, wonderful panel um, of producers, uh, Marta, supported by Natalie, Louise, and Louise Miguel. That is a very, very uh, good session, very informative for me at least, and I hope for you. Thank you for staying through to the end. Um, I think the logistics now that there's going to be a short video and talk for a couple of minutes, and then uh, dinner will be at 5.45. And we're being thrown off the stage. One more time, please. Thank you. I'm your video. Don't be too disappointed. <laughs> Um, all right, so um, now I want to bring up um, somebody who has helped us pull this conference together from a food and beverage standpoint. Um, Matt Rogers is um, food service district manager for Aramark. Um, he is located at UNC Wilmington, where he and Marie, one of his team members, have helped lead the charge um, in their effort to make UNC Wilmington a fair trade university. Um, he also has, over the last several months, um, helped play a major role in our planning of this conference um, and making sure, again, that the food that you're eating um, and that the, the drinks that you're drinking are sourced as sustainably as possible. So Matt's going to come up and just tell us a little bit about some of the programs that uh, Aramark has that have led to some of the menu items that we'll have, um, and then I'll give you the kind of logistical uh, rundown for what the dinner's going to look like. Matt Rogers. Thanks, Billy. It's an honor to be here. I appreciate you guys. Um, I stayed up late last night putting together about 87 slides to share with you guys, and then I realized that I was in between dinner, and, and so I'm going to hold that till tomorrow. That's okay with you guys. Uh, it's an honor to be here. You guys are an inspiration. On behalf of the 260,000 employees, that Aramark employees, I want to say thanks. You inspire us. I, would just, I beg of you to continue to push us, uh, to continue to be the carrot and stick that we heard about this morning. Uh, you know, you are the future of what we're going to serve and do in this country, so thank you so much. Um, I also want to 
I really think Billy. For those of you guys who don't know, Billy actually serves on our Sustainable Sourcing Policy Council, which is designed to really help us advance our supply chain throughout all of Aramark. And so I also want to say that, you know, I have been a, a, a bit of a help in this conference, but Billy and his team have done a lot. So if we can, just for a moment, give them a round of applause. And last, uh, on behalf of Georgetown University, uh, they are our long-standing partners. And for those of you who don't know, we serve their uh, dining operations from a higher ed perspective, uh, their students and athletes. And we also serve this conference center that some of you guys are staying in and also dining in tonight. So um, I had a chance to talk to the chef out there, um, I just catch up with them a little bit. Chef Trent's been there 29 years, uh, which is a long time, uh, almost as old as I am. Uh, and I had the chance to kind of get a sense of, you know, all the stuff he, he sourced for you guys tonight. So he's got a great menu for you guys. He found some great local free-range chicken from a farmer up the road in Chesapeake. Um, he got uh, some of the best produce we can get right now. If you guys missed out on being here on Wednesday, it was miserable. Um, I'm glad that you guys are here today. It's beautiful. Um, we also got some seafood that we source from our sustainable seafood partners through Monterey Bay Seafood Aquarium Watch. And so I think you'll find a great uh, spread out there tonight. Uh, after dinner, uh, for those of you guys staying on campus uh, here, um, there's not a lot up here, if you noticed. Uh, but just down the hill, uh, there is a place called Bulldog Tavern. Uh, you know, for those of you who are 21 or older, uh, the beer's cold. Uh, and the TVs do have the games on, so if you guys want to watch the games tonight. Uh, for those of you who want to go a little further, M Street's not that far away. I recommend you get out and, and do all that Georgetown has to offer. You're in a great spot. Um, and so, again, on behalf of Aramark and all, that, uh, all of our employees and our staff, uh, I want to say again, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity, and thank you, Billy, and your team. All right. Now I'm all that's standing between you and dinner. So I'll be brief. Um, but I want to take a minute to acknowledge um, a really important funder, uh, not just sponsor of this conference, but investor in our work with Fair Trade Campaigns. Um, the Stiller Family Foundation, uh, which was founded by Bob Stiller, who founded and started Green Mountain Coffee, um, has been doing philanthropic work and winning awards for that work um, for a long, long time. This foundation has been incredibly important in our history with fair trade campaigns. Um, at our early days in the second year of this program really being formalized, they gave us a three-year grant um, that not just invested in our work and covered our operational costs for three years, um, but also invested in all of you and invested in the programs that we ran that I truly believe have been foundational to the building the foundation that we stand on um, right now and how we've been able to scale and grow to the place that we are today. So just a few things uh, to know that that grant did. Um, in three years, it set up a small grant program for our local coalitions. Um, we were able to distribute $64,000 to local fair trade advocacy groups uh, through that program to help build capacity um, in communities like fair trade, with Fair Trade Boston, Chicago Fair Trade, Fair Trade Los Angeles, and many, many other communities. Um, so again, not just investing in our work, but investing in the work that's going on in the community um, with you guys. That funding also allowed us to um, run producer tours. In a three-year period, we ran more producer tours in the U.S. than any other organization in the country. So we brought um, six producers um, over two years and five producers in the third year um, to be able to visit our campaigns. You all planned events. We, we, we traveled with those folks um, and really allowed us to help you know, origin trips are incredibly meaningful um, and they're difficult to deliver on a grand scale. So being able um, to do the next best thing and invite farmers and workers and artisans to come see the advocacy work that we're doing um, in our communities and on our campuses um, and the effort and energy that all of you put into putting those events on. And um, for those we were able to bring with us, we did also have three origin trips. Um, so we brought groups of 15 of you um, to Costa Rica, to the Dominican Republic, and to southern Mexico um, to see fair trade firsthand on the ground, to have those light bulb moments, those aha experiences. So um, I know there are definitely some people who are on those origin trips um, or who were uh, hosting some of those producer tours. So if you could just stand up real quickly. Um, Two of you, excellent. Three of you, excellent. <laughs> um, 
you can find those folks uh, and talk to them about the experiences that they had, and, and many more were a part of that as well. Um, so the Stiller Family Foundation support has been critical to our, our growth and to our foundation. And for this conference, um, they wanted to make sure that we had as many of you here as possible. Um, so you saw us mention the Campus Partnership Program, um, and so many of you, I think 55 of you are here with the support of 16 campuses funding. But we also heard that there were a lot who weren't able to secure that funding. Um, and so when we were in conversations with the foundation about what the needs were, um, we said we got a lot of people that we would love to be here who can't do that on their own. 90 of you are here on travel stipends from that sponsorship. That's over a quarter of the attendance of this conference. Um, in addition, and this is where we get to dinner, um, and is that slide up? I can't see it on the monitor. Okay, great. Um, so our vision for this dinner was to source several different restaurants in the area and assign a topic to each one. Well, we called it a topic-based dine-around. Um, and the foundation said, if you do that, people are going to have to pay for their own dinner. We said, well, yeah, that helps contain conference costs. Um, and they said, no, no, don't, don't do that. <laughs> um, so this dinner tonight is not on you. Um, it is on the Stiller Family Foundation. And they wanted to provide that space to ensure that we were all here together to facilitate conversations about where we can take this movement in the future. Um, so these topics are meant to spur on that conversation to get us thinking not just where we are today, but where can we get to? What does the future of fair trade look like? Um, and so the way this will work is um, when I finally let you guys go eat, um, you'll head out there, you'll get your food. We need to ask that you start by sitting in conference rooms A, B, and D, E, because the fabulous staff here are going to flip these tables over for dinner. Not literally flip them over, but turn them over. Um, and when you registered for the conference, you indicated a topic that you were interested in discussing. Um, hopefully you remember that. If not, it's not the end of the world. But those topics are up here, and there are table numbers on all of the tables. So we just ask that you either stick with the topic you've, you identified, or if you, to the best of your recollection, the topic that interests you most. And there are questions that we sourced from many of you um, to get that conversation going. You don't have to use those questions, but they're a great way to spur on the conversation. And there's some questions that a lot of you, your colleagues and friends, um, thought would be a great piece um, uh, as a conversation starter. So um, there are only two other things that I, that I want to announce. I want to remind everybody that there is that campus sustainability walk uh, tomorrow morning at 730. Uh, those who are interested can meet right outside here in the, in the gallery. Um, and uh, Audrey Stewart, who you heard from last night, will be leading that. Um, and then finally, in a show of gratitude to the Stiller Family Foundation, we'd like to ask now, once we break, for all of those who came on one of those travel stipends to come up here, um, and we'd like to take a group picture of all of you um, so we can send that to the foundation and let them see uh, the happy faces of everybody who's here, uh, thanks to their support. So, thank you for sticking with us all the way till now. Go forth and eat, unless you got a travel stipend, come up. Thank you. <laughs>